Okay, welcome everyone to today's webinar, uh, The Great Protein Debate, hosted by the SDG2 Advocacy Hub in collaboration with the CGIR. My name's Paul Newnham and I'm the director of the SDG2 Advocacy Hub and also a vice chair of the UN Food Systems Summit Champions Network. I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating today's conversation. Um, and we really have got a great group of people uh, talking today, and we want you as the, our audience to really get involved, whether you're watching on Facebook, uh, whether you're following online uh, with the hashtags, or whether you're uh, a part of this dialogue. Um, let us know where you're from in the chat function, um, who you're representing, um, so that we can see where people are coming from. Um, we encourage people that have questions to use the, the question and answer function. We hope to have time for some questions as uh, conversations go. If by any chance you get uh, dropped off or there's any issues, this will be live streamed on the Sustainable Development Goal 2 Advocacy Hub Facebook. And it's also going to be recorded and uploaded to the SDG 2 Advocacy Hub YouTube and also the Food System Summit uh, YouTube. So it's going to be there. Um, we'd love you to post about the webinar on your social channels. Uh, when you're doing this, if you can use the hashtags of protein debate, uh, good food for all and one CGIR, we can then follow that conversation um, afterwards. I'm sure there's going to be lots of conversation and we won't get to every question here, but if you use those hashtags, we can then hopefully continue that conversation. We're also going to have a few polls that are going to come up, they'll pop up on screen. Um, and it's just a chance to hear from you. Um, so what we're gonna do um, just before we hand over to uh, some great friends and food system champions uh, to give some introductory remarks, I'm just gonna say a few words on today's topic and how we got here. Um, too often uh, our discussions can often get caught in different perspectives um, in different camps. And rather than having an open-minded, constructive and forward-thinking conversation, we can sometimes get caught in trying to defend a position. Um, and what we wanted to do today was to enable a conversation around protein that tries to take a holistic view. Um, and that this conversation is, is not gonna talk about a one size fits all solution for everywhere. Um, and we're really grateful to uh, Lawrence Haddad who has written a, a great insightful article which you would have received uh, just before the webinar an hour before um, in the chat. And it's, it's, it just it's, provides a really helpful basis that we've based some of the conversation. And he'll, he'll, he'll talk a little bit about that. We're also gonna drop a link in the chat there that you can follow along. What we wanna do today with today's conversation is to really encourage a nuanced nuance perspective and analysis. We wanna talk about the fact that the role of protein in food systems and diets can be looked at from many different angles and that each has benefits and trade-offs. There's a lot of competing messages that drive decisions around what proteins we do or do not champion. And so to help understand this, um, we wanna talk about it. Um, sometimes we tend to distinguish between high, middle and low income countries. But while that may be true, you know, there's certain things, a high income country, people may consume too much processed uh, uh, meat and red meat and livestock could also is true that it builds the livelihoods of small scale farmers in low income countries and also really adds to food insecurity issues and nutrition uh, nutrient inadequacies. So when we're talking about uh, protein in food systems, we have to look at health, nutrition, the environment, livelihoods, to name a few, and they're all connected. And so given these complexities, what we're aiming for today is to share our experiences our expertise coming from different parts of the world and different walks of life and to discuss how given our common goal to transform the food system and achieve good food for all and the health of people and planet, we can accelerate action. So we wanna talk also a little bit about the role that investment in research um, to drive innovation and sustainability is key. And we wanna talk a little bit about this in the coming um, uh, conversation. So I'd just like to um, basically, instead of trying to uh, have too many formalities in introducing our guests, I'm gonna hand over and invite um, uh, 
two people to make some introductory remarks before we move to our panel. Um, we have a poll that's just popped up and it, it just shows you the diversity of protein sources um, that people have in their diets. And so you can see a number of different elements there coming out and this shows the difference of people um, around uh, the world. So we'll share those results um, as well. Um, so I'm just going to invite uh, Dr. Lawrence Haddad uh, first to come in. Uh, so Dr. Lawrence is um, an economist by training, the executive director at GAIN, and is also appointed to uh, chair the Action Track 1 for the UN Food System Summit. And so he's going to kick us off with some context and scene setting uh, for the later uh, panel discussion. So a very warm welcome and the floor is over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks to the panelists. We have a great, great group of panelists for you. Thanks to STG2 Advocacy Hub for hosting this event. Uh, as Paul said, it's, it's really hard to let go of defended positions, but the issues today are, are pretty complex. I'm going to spend five, six minutes just walking through some of the complexities and uh, maybe offer some ways to simplify, but not oversimplify. The, uh, the, the space. So first I'm gonna share a screen, if I can. Um, yep, I hope you can see that. Yep. Can, yes, no? Yes, we can, Lawrence. <laughs> Good, so this is, a, this is a slide from a paper that we did. Actually, I'm not the lead author. Stella Nordhagen and Ty Beal are the, are the lead authors. Uh, they, I'm, I'm tagging along for the ride. And it's about animal source foods and it's about how different types of, it's a review of the literature really. And this is a, a summary table of that review. It's, just, it's our, the author's interpretation of the literature. And it basically says each column is a different type of animal source food from dairy all the way through to um, processed meat and white meat. And then each row is, is an outcome that we care about. Um, it's uh, you know an SDG outcome. It's an outcome that the Food System Summit is is worrying about. There's a there's a group of outcomes under the health head heading. There's a group of outcomes under the environment heading, and then there's some livelihood outcomes. And it's really an attempt to say what does the literature say about the production and consumption choices around, for example, dairy, uh, going down that dairy column on all the all the outcomes that we we care about. And, you know, ideally, we'd like all of this to be green, right, and moving in the right direction. But it's not all green. There's lots of neutral spaces. There's lots of red spaces, which is not good, and pink spaces, which is not good. And there are lots of blanks, which is um, we just don't have much evidence at all. Um, so we're, we're inhabiting a very complex space. And if you're a policymaker, you'd be, you'd be hard pushed to figure out what to do. So to make the to make the policy recommendations a bit simpler, uh, the attempt we, we made an attempt to try to yeah simplify reality a little bit. So here is a column for high income consumers, and they can be high income consumers in high income countries, but they sometimes can be high income consumers in middle and low income countries. And here the policy if the policy aim is to improve human health, it's pretty clear from the the weight of the evidence that we should be reducing animal source food consumption, especially for those with very Western style consumption patterns. That's pretty clear for your own health and well-being. Uh, if you want to improve planetary health, it's pretty clear, again, need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions of ASF production and reduce ASF consumption. That will also help improve planetary health. And if you're going to promote livelihoods, you want to manage livelihood transitions away from those who may lose livelihoods because of the transition from animal source foods to plant-based foods. In the low income, for low income consumers, and, and predominantly these will be in low and middle income countries, here you want to increase the animal source food consumption for nutritionally vulnerable groups with low animal source food consumption. This is a pretty uncontroversial recommendation from UNICEF, especially for young children and women of reproductive age. For improving, improving planetary health, you want to reduce the greenhouse gas emission per unit of animal source 
production, uh, animal source food production in low income settings is incredibly uh, wasteful. It, obviously, that's not good for animal animals themselves, but it's also really inefficient in terms of generating lots of greenhouse gases, which yield actually relatively little uh, edible food. And then, um, of course, also reduce animal source food consumption if it is high even for low income consumers for their own health. And then of course, livelihood impacts from animal source foods are very important in many low income settings. And uh, any, any livelihood, uh, any enhanced productivity livelihood initiatives should, should, make it, should make a positive difference for livelihoods. Now the real, the really tricky bit is comes in the middle income consumers, um, whether they're in wherever they are in the world and that, that gets really complicated for policymakers, but these are the two extremes. So my conclusions really uh, from the from my introductory comments are that geography and income really matter. Just as Paul said, this is a this is a justice issue too. Too often it's seen as uh, consumers and, and advocates in Europe and North America telling people in Africa and Asia what to eat. I got trapped into this myself a couple of years ago when I was tweeting about animal source food consumption being so high. And I had a bunch of a bunch of people from Africa tweeting back to me, essentially saying, can't you just let us eat our ham in peace? You know, you guys have been eating meat for a, a century and now you want to deny us the ability to consume meat. So it, it is a justice and equity issue as well because of the geography and income. There is a lot of variation. I don't have time to, to show it to you, but there's a lot of variation across different types of animal source foods for health impacts, environment impacts, and livelihood outcomes. Some animal source foods have twice, twice the greenhouse gas emissions of plant foods, but some have uh, 25 times the emission of animal, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions from plant foods. But also even within animal source, source food types, even within uh, pork or chicken or eggs or beef, there's a huge variation in terms of uh, environmental impacts depending on the production system used. So the good news is there are many food production supply and consumption policy choices to achieve positive outcomes on these multiple fronts. We have degrees of freedom, that's good, that's really good. Uh, and because we have degrees of freedom, nuance is our friend and ideology is our enemy. Paul, back to you. I love that. Nuance is our friend and ideology is our enemy. I think that's a, an amazing statement. So thank you so much, Lawrence, for just this uh, thoughtful um, introduction and these clear words going uh, beyond the topic of uh, just thinking animal-based proteins. Um, and and, and Gunhild, I, I, I welcome you, uh, Gunhild Stordalen, who is uh, the, the founder and executive chair of EAT. Um, I, I'm inviting you now to talk about linking climate, health, um, and sustainability issues, um, going beyond just animal-based, what are the alternate proteins, the shifting diets, um, and so uh, you're also the chair of Action Track 2 for the UN Food Systems Summit, uh, which is, is, is looking at sustainable consumption. So um, over to you, uh, Gunhild, to add to our uh, start. So much, Paul, and thanks to you and uh, and CGR and the Hub for hosting this extremely timely discussion of uh, the future of proteins. And and also thank you, Lawrence, for a brilliant uh, presentation, really fleshing out both the complexity but also shedding a much more nuanced light over animal proteins. So uh, let me just uh, reinforce two things. Uh, first. Meat is not the problem. It's over overconsumption and overproduction in many regions of the world, that is. And second, there are at least 50 shades of red when it comes to meat. There are bad and sustainably factory farmed meats, and there are good sustainably produced meat from regenerative farming systems that help sequester carbon in the soil, that is free ranged and grass fed and reared with good animal welfare. But the science is clear. It would be impossible for 10 billion people to eat the amount of meat 
typical of Western diets today, and at the same time for the world to stand the chance to deliver on the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. So despite, as Lawrence mentioned, there are regions and people that still need to increase their intake of meat and animal proteins for their nutritional needs, for example, in Southeast Asia, at a global level, and especially when it comes to affluent population groups, we need to curb overconsumption of animal proteins, especially red meat, to be able to stay within planetary boundaries. So then the question is, how do we ensure protein, enough quality protein to everyone as the population grows to 10 billion by mid-century? So there are three main pathways to solve the protein puzzle, if you will. Uh, first, on the production side, focusing on reducing the climate and environmental impact of meat and animal proteins will be important. And secondly, on the consumption side, uh, obviously critical to uh, identify and work on measures to shift consumer behavior, which is a key focus for the action track that I'm leading on for the UN summit. Uh, and then also innovations to diversify our protein mix uh, by adding more diversity uh, of proteins to our plates. So I will focus on the consumption side here. Um, the Eat Lancet report, as well as several other major studies, suggest that an optimal healthy reference diet is a flexitarian but uh, plant-rich diet. And uh, furthermore, the global burden of disease studies are categorical. The biggest health risk is not uh, related to what we are consuming too much of, but rather what we are consuming too little of. And today we universally underconsume fruits, nuts, vegetables, and plant-based proteins like legumes and pulses. And legumes and pulses like beans are not just the rock stars of nutrition, uh, good for our gut health and our overall health, but they are also really the cornerstone of nature positive production. So if there are one thing we all should eat more of that is good for people and planet, and obviously also the animals, uh, it's beans and other legumes. And fortunately, there are so many culinary traditions where beans and legumes already play a central role. I mean, who doesn't love a good Middle Eastern hummus, uh, Indian dal, Mexican bean burritos, or red red, uh, which is one of Ghana's signature dishes with black eyed peas. So parts of the answer lie in our traditions and local food cultures, while another part of the protein equation is innovation whether it's smaller incremental improvements uh, or the major steps that may change our relationship with the animal kingdom forever. So first, plant-based replacement products are now the fastest growing market segment in food retail. Plant milk and dairy replacement are popping up in our fridges. Uh, veggie burgers are now so closely mimicking uh, the real deal that is almost impossible to taste the difference. But despite these products are generally more environmentally sustainable, the health impact might not be sustainable. Uh, a vegan burger is still a burger and something we shouldn't uh, consume too much of. Uh, however, together with uh, uh, other innovations like cultured or lab-grown meats, precision fermentation, um, et cetera, these innovations are making the protein shift more palatable uh, for our hardcore barbecue lovers, if you will. Uh, and finally, there are some animal proteins that uh, we should increase the production of uh, in a sustainable, healthy food future. Uh, the first is blue food. Uh, inter interestingly, uh, because despite 70% uh, of the planet's surface um, uh, is blue, uh, only 2% of our calories come from uh, the ocean or lakes and rivers. Uh, and the science shows that it's a huge potential to scale up blue food, uh, but it has to be sustainable. So farmed salmon uh, fed soy from uh, the rainforest in Brazil is obviously not the solution, uh, but it can be done. Um, and second, uh, insects and bugs have uh, low environmental impact and they can be raised on waste and thereby spearhead the move towards a circular agri-economy.
So finally, the challenges ahead are immense to fix our food system and provide the world with enough quality proteins and no single sector entity or technology can fix this alone. But the opportunities and synergies are even bigger. And uh, the UN Food System Summit this year offers a unique and historic opportunity for the world to come together to unlock these synergies and opportunities. And I really believe that collectively, we can help drive the technologies, the innovations and solutions and policy reforms needed to make healthy, sustainable and truly good proteins available for everybody everywhere. Thank you and over. Thank you, um, Gunhild. Uh, just, I love the fact that you covered so much ground just around all of these opportunities, all of these potential um, solutions and pathways to really deal with this, this protein challenge that we face around sustainable consumption. And I think it's, it's really um, uh, no small task that you're, you're, you're helping to lead for the UN Food System Summit to try and bring together some game-changing solutions. But I love that you are bringing in a lot of innovation there, thinking about blue food, insects, a number of different elements, but also balancing that with human health. And so the planetary conversation with the, the human health conversation, and I think this is so critical um, because sometimes many of our solutions just focus on one. So um, thank you, Gunhild, and uh, really appreciate it. If you, you're welcome to uh, stay around, um, but I also am aware you need to potentially run. Um, there are a few, few questions coming in the chat, so um, maybe have a look, but I, I, I appreciate your time. So um, thank you, uh, Gunhild. Um, I'm, I'm really excited now to invite our highly distinguished panel um, to join us. Uh, we have a great foundation uh, laid from uh, Lawrence and Gunhild, um, really bringing out uh, some of the, 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 the tone and the conversation that we need to have. And so I'm going to invite our panel to join. We have uh, two chefs joining us and uh, 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 two doctors and uh, or research doctors. Um, and so I want to welcome um, from our Chef's Manifesto Network, uh, Chef Connor Spacey, um, Chef uh, Selassie Adekada. Um, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Kenaya Nwanze um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Namkolo Kovic. Um, so welcome to you all. I'm going to just ask you to introduce yourself briefly. Where are you? Um, who, who, who are you working for? And I'd also love you to just tell us, we're talking about food here today. We're talking about protein, but we're talking about food. So just tell us in a very brief um, starting point, what did you have for breakfast this morning or lunch, depending on your time zone um, before this webinar? So um, let's see, uh, Chef Selassie, do you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm in Accra, Ghana. And as Gunhild actually hinted to, I had red red for lunch. So red red is uh, sort of um, black eyed peas or cow peas stewed in uh, tomatoes and a bit of palm oil and um, eaten with plantain. Awesome. Sounds sounds delicious. Um, uh, Dr. Namkolo. Yes, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you're joining. Uh, I had oatmeal porridge uh, today for breakfast. And that's all I had. And then um, I am calling in from South Africa, but my workstation is actually in Ethiopia. I'm here temporarily. Thank you. Thank you. Um, over to Chef Connor. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Chef Connor Spacey. I'm based here in Ireland, um, and I work for a large catering company called Food Space. I haven't had lunch because it's lunchtime and I'm here. So I'll have lunch after this. Uh, for breakfast though, I had some lovely uh, Irish oats soaked uh, in, in apple juice. And then I had like a lovely Irish apple um, with some raisins and nuts, like a syrup poured over them. So nice, uh, nice breakfast that'll keep me going until after our talk today. <laughs> Perfect, thanks Chef. Uh, Dr. Kanaya. Oh, you're on mute, sir. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you. Uh, thanks for and thanks for inviting me to this very uh, what seems to to, to be a, a very interesting um, 
a debate. Um, my name is Kaina Yongwanze. I am currently in London, but I am based in Nigeria. Um, what did I have for breakfast? Very interesting. I, I also had similar thing as our colleague from again, um, fried plantain, which we call dodo. Uh, very nice stew. And some omelette, of course, topped up with some Kenyan Arabica coffee. Wow. Sounds, sounds wow. delicious. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm thinking about food already. So as we get this conversation going, I can see lots of comments coming in the chat and some, some questions there. Um, the team are going to be looking at them to pull some questions out for our conversation as we uh, go forward. Uh, remember to use the, the, the protein debate, um, hashtag uh, good food for all, one, one CGIR, uh, if you're sharing about this um, online. So to start off with, let's just um, jump straight in. I'm going to ask, uh, talk a little bit about protein in different parts of the world. So Chef Connor, um, are you able to uh, share an innovation you've seen um, and explain how people are approaching adding protein to their diet in your part of the world? Yeah, so I, I think I think just to, to step back for a minute, it, it, it's not, um, not that it's not an easy subject. It, it, it can be a very complicated way of how people view different types of proteins, um, both globally and here in Ireland. Um, and for me as a chef, I have for, I suppose, more around environmental reasons um, have you know, really pushed or really um, pushed forward more plant-based diets, um, but also in a way that I'm looking for a happy balance. Because depending on, on consumers, people have different reasons as to what, why their diets are what they are. Some can be around um, animal welfare, some can be around the environment, and some can be both. Um, so for me, it's trying to um, get a good balance. Um, and for us in our restaurants, I think how we have been successful in, in using more plant-based and more balanced dishes um, has been more on the language we use. And um, we don't distinguish um, our dishes so on as being plant-based, vegetarian, vegan, or anything like that. We just use the dishes as what they are. Um, and we don't label them. And in that way, um, consumers that like, um, that eat meat protein might happily want to try another dish that could have be plant-based or be legume-based and you know have nuts and seeds because it's not labeled as being as a consumer might see as being anti-meat in, in, in some ways. Um, that has worked very well for us because at the beginning about five years ago when we introduced more plant-based dishes on our menus they didn't really uh, take off as such um, and because I found by talking to our consumers, a lot of it was more about the language we were using. So for me, it, it is about, it, it's about a balanced diet um, and not labeling it. And, and that has worked very well for us um, throughout our restaurants. Thanks, Chef. Um, over to you, Chef Selassie. Is this uh, the same or different in Ghana where you're based? Um, I, I agree with Connor. Uh, I had similar sort of approach to it. So I don't um, really announce or say what I'm doing. Um, I have a very sort of um, a different concept. It's not a classic restaurant. So we do dining experiences. And what I realized at the beginning is if I said, oh, did you want the vegetarian option or the non-vegetarian option? Um, particularly in, uh, in Accra where there's a lot of middle-class uh, people coming to my, my experiences. Psychologically, there's... Um, a lot of weight on what you eat and the linkage it has to your status. Um, so someone's gonna see vegetarian and not go towards it, but actually if you just tell them it's a really delicious dish, no name, no label, people are gonna try it. So I very much do the same thing. Um, and I would say in Ghana, um, there's a lot of um, traditional dishes that actually are plant forward. Um, even the red red that I was talking about earlier, there's usually a bit of dried um, either shrimp powder or fish powder or smoked fish that's added to it that adds a, a huge amount of flavor um, yeah. without it being, you know, so it's, it's really about flavor and, and making it delicious. And that's what I realized in my, in my kitchen, um, in my dining room, that's what people are looking for rather than it's this or that, you know, a label. Yeah. No, that's really, really helpful. Um, and it's good to see the similarities, but also the differences and, and the approaches. And I think it, you know, it is really um, 
you know, me has a very different approach depending on where you are in the world and it can be connected to status and there's a, there's a whole range of different things, but there's also all different alternatives. And by taking out some of the labels, it also it stands the dish up on its merits. So I think that's great. So moving beyond the chef um, perspective to you, uh, Dr. Namkolo, um, you're a senior researcher from IFPRI for the CGIR and working specifically on the topics of nutrition and food safety. And I see there's quite a bit around nutrition and food safety coming through in our chat um, as well. From an African perspective, what are the important considerations around protein when it comes to nutrition and food safety? You're on mute. Uh, yeah, perfect. Well, to start, I think, as, as others have said, I think Lawrence mentioned this and, and Gunheld as well, generally protein consumption um, in Africa is limited, um, especially among the poor. Um, but we also have aspirations to consuming more protein. And as Selassie has said, um, some of our dishes actually use protein perhaps as a flavoring rather than as, as a food per se and therefore, we may not necessarily get the right amount of uh, nutrients from it that would be uh, desirable. But the cost of protein sources, both plant and animal are higher compared to the cereals and tubers or upon which most of our uh, consumption is based. And then food safety, of course, is of concern for all nutrient dense foods, um, such as meat, fish and eggs. And as we uh, make this transition towards consuming more animal source foods, then food safety issues surrounding uh, handling practices and infrastructure are extremely important to look at. Food safety concerns also include uh, issues around bacterial contamination, viral parasites, as well as chemical hazards. And as we try and address increasing food production, we are also using more pesticides, and these are adding to the complexities of food safety. And also more recently, we are also picking up use of antibiotics in livestock production. Again, that brings in additional uh, food safety uh, challenges. It is estimated that food safety burden of disease in Africa actually compares to malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV. We normally don't think about it that way. But on the debate as to whether we should move away from animal uh, derived protein or not, the situation is a lot more complex uh, and we need nuance. Animal protein, because of its high quality, um, has very good micronutrient content and an efficient supplier of these nutrients. And in terms of affordability because of the cost, because you can add small amounts for better benefit, this is actually found to be able to lower the cost sometimes of the diet based on work that the World Food Program has done. Um, animal source protein then can then for be consumed in small quantities to make a really big difference. And as we aspire for higher consumption of animal source protein, this is one of the things that is often forgotten, that those that need to increase can increase and still meet their nutrient intake, but those that consume too much must reduce, even within the African context. Yeah. But we must not forget that uh, we have different population settings, and there are areas where producing uh, livestock is actually part of the cultural setting. And in some desert and arid areas, this might be the only livelihood or actually the predominant sustenance in terms of nutrition. So such context should not be forgotten, both from a health perspective, a nutrition perspective, and indeed as, as well from a livelihood perspective. So it's really quite complex, requires some nuancing as we look to what we need to do better. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Doctor. Um, turning across to Dr. Kanayo, um, you've got a long history of working with smallholder farmers in different parts of the world. 
what importance does protein play in their lives and for their livelihoods? Dr. Namkulo mentioned this, but could you give us some insights? Uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Well, I, I think uh, what Dr. Namkula just said, um, in many ways, he has said it better than I would have. Um, I have had firsthand experience, you know, as you, as you did mention, uh, working in several uh, continents and countries of the world. Uh, for basically smallholder farmers who have been my primary uh, focus, especially those from uh, low income and middle income countries, we find that, um, of course, animal source foods like milk, eggs, and fish are the main sources of protein. But, uh, but also recognize that in their diets, while the quantities of uh, animal, animal um, uh, um, those foods may be small. They are augmented, of course, by plant-based uh, foods and proteins like beans. You know, whether they are uh, cow peas in, the, in, the, in West Africa or um, a different kind of beans or haricot beans in the eastern part of the country, or for instance, in India, where they have a whole range of uh, chickpeas and pea, uh, cow peas, of course, as well as uh, other beans. So they are, of course, highly, highly uh, supplemented. But, but, but we recognize that in um, communities of smallholder farmers where they consume more animal-based uh, foods, they have a much higher, better nutritional status. Uh, they have also better enrollment in schools, but also those that engage in uh, either poultry or uh, cattle, or even fishing, uh, higher income growth, and of course also gender equality, where the women have a major role to play in those things. But you know, livestock as such, you know, play a very important economic and socio-cultural roles in the well-being of rural households. You know, they you find you find these households have higher income, as I said, asset saving, source of employment, and then of course in terms of soil fertility, livelihoods transport and agriculture diversification. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole range of, 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 uh, of um, uh, outcomes that you find in this case. But I think what's important is that, you know, while in high income countries has been, has been mentioned, you know, uh, are encouraged to reduce animal, animal foods, low and middle income countries should extend interventions to improve availability and accessibility. And here, this is again to again uh, emphasize what my colleague just said from IFPRI, is not so uh, not to undermine the role of plant-based uh, proteins. And I think this is oftentimes, well, uh, like, like I think Lauren said, you know, in his paper, not one size fits all. So there are, of course, uh, issues involved here. Um, but maybe maybe later we'll have to see that it's not just it's not just accessibility and affordability and so on also the policy dimension is, is very important you know and this is something i'm sure that uh, our colleague from ifri can speak more to uh, yeah. what are yeah. the policy dimensions that actually uh, impact on low income uh, uh, countries to to be able to uh, you know increase their 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 their, their pro, uh, animal animal source foods. So yeah. in, in essence, you know, it's, it's, it's basically one where one, one sees very clearly where in communities where, for instance, you can very clearly see but Ethiopia has the largest population of, 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 of cattle in Africa or Eastern Africa, Kenya and the rest. And, and then in the Sahel of West Africa, where these are basically uh, livestock communities and they raise a lot of livestock. Or in the coastal countries, where or coastal areas where there's a lot of fish, fish, fish consumption as well. So one can see how this balance, well, how this distribution uh, across the continent of Africa. Not to talk about what we see in Asia and Latin America as well. Yeah. No, thank you, Doctor. Doctor uh, Namkolo, do you want to respond to the policy aspect, just uh, with any thoughts? Um, yes. Uh, very quickly to say that. A lot of our agricultural policies have actually been biased towards staple food production. Um, and so we haven't paid as much attention as we should to things like livestock production and productivity. And so there's really need to see that balance 
uh, coming on board uh, to be able to uh, produce more. I, I, I often joke, but I, I think it's, it's not so much of a joke that I am quite sure a glass of milk uh, in a pastoralist community produces a lot more greenhouse gases than one in a, in a more productive uh, uh, practice. And so there are some of these areas where we actually need uh, help. The other part on the policy space is the issue of how do we improve production of nutrient dense foods, including animal source foods, because movement of these foods are actually difficult. Uh, we're moving live animals um, around and, and, and part of the reason is because we do not have cold value chains. So the policy space needs to create an enabling environment for different types of developments and market value chains to develop. And this is an area where definitely uh, efforts are required. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, jumping across to you, um, Chef Selassie, uh, you've worked for UNICEF in the past. Um, and so you've got kind of a unique perspective here from a development um, perspective, as well as a culinary. Um, how do you see in a culinary space uh, the use of different proteins to address some of these different issues? Um, I think one of my, <clears throat> if I can say one of my sort of aha moments was um, doing some support to um, a nutrition response in Northern Nigeria. And the product that is used is something called Plumpy Nut, which is a fortified um, groundnut paste, peanut butter, which is fortified with micronutrients so that it becomes um, actually a medicine. Um, and in this part of Northern Nigeria, I could see that at the same time, groundnuts could grow and were growing in that area. But the issues around nutrition and malnutrition are so varied um, that we really need to go much beyond lean year access or no access. We need to also look at a lot of the social um, practices and, and other elements that are playing into um, what and how we eat what we eat. Um, but uh, in terms of you know, the conversation I think we've been having is you know, what, what is a community? Um, what are the livelihoods of the community? What grows where we are and what do we have access to? So for example, you know, there's a access to um, in West Africa, we're eating a lot of snails in Ghana, we're eating goat. There's so many other forms of protein besides sort of the classic sort of cows and, and poultry. Um, I think we need to look at biodiversity. What, you know, what really is available to us and have, what have we been eating and what's good, what we need to increase, um, make more productive and what um, maybe we need to reduce. And I think, um, I've always been playing around with the idea of whatever we need is actually around us mostly. Um, and we need to kind of look at how best to uh, bring that to the plate. Yeah, no, thank you, Chef. I'd like to jump across and, and dive a bit deeper into the topic of agriculture research and innovation. So it was brought up a little bit before that there's, there's a gap somewhat in potentially some of the innovation, the investments around um, this livestock space. And Dr. Kanayo, as the CGIR representative for the UN Food Systems Summit, could you tell us a little bit more about why agricultural research and innovation for transforming food systems and driving progress and action is so important? Oh, thank you again, Paul. I think, first of all, let me mention that transforming food systems is crucial if we really want to achieve SDG2. And uh, research is the starting point of this transformation. I think that's that. I need to emphasize this before we go further. Uh, and this is what the CGR does. You know, the CGR is the is 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 the world's largest publicly funded uh, research network, and it's actually a network, a network, a network of partnerships, which is core to the work of the CGR. You know, a global presence in about <clears throat> four countries in, in four countries, sorry, with about a total of ten thousand, you know, staff. And a local presence in, in 70 countries. So you, you, the CGR actually is addressing uh, the problem globally. And when we talk about our network of partnerships, is, I'm not talking about partnerships among scientists and researchers. It's partnership with national policy makers, of course, research and academia, uh, government institutions, investors, donors, the public, uh, the public private sector. Uh, 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 NGOs, but more importantly, partnerships with the people that we serve as smallholder farmers. Now, we're talking about nutrition, um, but I think the biggest challenge that we have in this area of nutrition is malnutrition. 
And this has a multifaceted context. One is hunger. Then you have undernutrition, as was mentioned, due to insufficient intake of proteins, vitamins, minerals, obes and then of course you have obesity and unhealthy diets uh, on the other extreme. So uh, feeding people well is as important as feeding people enough. It's not just, it's just not, it's not just enough to have eaten enough food, but have you eaten well? And I think this is, this is quite an issue that we have to, we have to look into. Now, I like to also emphasize that when we talk about agricultural research, it, it is very diverse and it delivers, you know, quality food. It addresses issues of sustainability. I think this was mentioned, equity, inclusiveness, trade-offs, synergies, but it allows us to prioritize, you know, to target and deliver solutions at scale, at local levels, you know, has very broad institutional and political context. So it's very important that, you know, we see this. Now, the, the, the CGIR is transforming itself and it's actually addressing a broad range of issues that cut across the development spectrum. Now we're developing a new uh, research innovation strategy, which will be launched this year. And it provides an opportunity to accelerate the achievements of the system. You know, re resilience, climate, equal opportunities, gender, you name it. But more importantly, to focus resources on protein rich foods but animal proteins as well as plant proteins, as we mentioned. But I think it's very key here because livestock, speaking in the broader sense, has received very little funding. You know, ODA, for example, as we know, currently it's about 0.3% uh, to research. But when you look at the importance of livestock, what are you talking about? The elements we just mentioned, is very minimal in terms of allocation to uh, livestock research. So this has to change, not only from the international community, but as our colleague Namukolo said, also national, and this calls for national policies. So that they are, you know, in essence, you know, the CGIR basically has provided solutions over, over, the, over, over the years, as it celebrates its 50 years of, 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 of research for development. I'm pretty sure, you know, we're going to, I'll, I mean, I, I could give you a long list of uh, what the CGI has done, but I don't think we have the time for that now, but perhaps so we have the, uh, the, the Q&A session. But there yeah. are a long mm -hmm. list of, uh, of contributions and the importance of agricultural research for development uh, in, in, in basically achieving the SDG too. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Dr. Kanaya. Um, I think, you know, if you aren't aware of what CGIR does, it's worth uh, looking up. There's some amazing innovations and this is a, a key year for CGIR. It's a, it's a research institute that is, is putting knowledge back into the way that we, we grow food, that we engage with food, um, that our agriculture and livelihoods, and this is so key for us to develop and to innovate. And, and so um, please, please follow them, check them out um, and have a look. I'm going to I'm going to jump across uh, to you, Chef Connor. Um, you're you're obviously um, in Ireland where you live, and in Ireland there is a big industry um, that is 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 focused on animal based protein. Um, in your work, you do a lot of focus around local and seasonal food, um, and and on reducing food waste and plant based ingredients. How do you you as a chef really use different ingredients to help make a practical and knowledge shift to alternate proteins? Yeah, good, good question. I, I suppose the view or, or the angle I take on it is looking back on, on the island of Ireland. I mean, we're, as you know, we're, we're a small island on the, on the side of Europe. We've got like 5 million population, but farming is embedded in our history. Farming um, and food production goes back centuries. You know what I mean? It's generations and generations of mixed farming between horticulture and um, livestock, dairy. And I suppose we're, we're, as a small nation, we're famous for our, our, our livestock, our meat production that is exported across the world, our beef, um, our butter, our cream, because of the, the, because of the climate we have and the rich soil and the grass that we can grow that we feed livestock to and so on and so forth. 
so for me, it wasn't just a view of, of not looking at livestock. It was a view of looking at our island of Ireland and what we produce here that has in some ways been forgotten about or in some ways um, people in Ireland aren't using as much of because of imports and so on and how even things are funded. So we, we kind of come up with a view of being local um, and there's different ways of looking at local. Ireland is so small. I mean, when we look at horticulture and vegetables and, uh, and grains and so on, we're looking at it nationally across our Ireland. And when we're looking at livestock and so on, we're looking at it more locally to where our kitchens are based because we're geographically spread out across the country. Um, but I think it's worth mentioning, the view we're taking is more around um, in an environmental look at our food system. Like our food system, as we know, is, is the food system is global, but um, I also need to look at it locally here, here in Ireland. Um, and we have a multitude of different types of farmers. We do produce livestock here in Ireland that is produced um, much more sustainable um, through different types of agriculture and so on. And then we have other livestock farmers that is very unsustainable in terms of, of how they produce their livestock. And for, for me, it was always about um, showcasing sustainable farming in its entirety. And that mm. does include livestock farming. It does include um, vegetables and horticulture. It includes grains that we grow here in Ireland. And even it includes our oceans as an island. We have a lot of natural resources and types of seaweed and so on. So our diet or our menus that we produce is based on looking at our island as a whole and showcasing sustainable food. Um, from an environmental point of view, sustainable food doesn't always mean planet or plant only food. It does include livestock, but we also have an abundance of, of great vegetables and plants and seaweeds and so on here in Ireland that doesn't get used enough of and is wasted. So from a waste point of view, we do um, provide more plant-based dishes um, purely from an environmental and waste point of view. And for me, as I mentioned earlier, that's always been about not labeling it, not putting things into boxes and going, this is meat, this is plants, this is legumes. It's more about just creating a dish. It might be 100% plant-based. It might contain some meat or uh, different types of proteins and dairy proteins. Um, but it's about making food taste great with the least amount of carbon footprint that we can make this dish from. And that's the point of view we, 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 we took from it. Um, and, and it has grown, like, like not unlike other countries, we've seen a huge uptake in, in um, people looking for more plant-based diets, be it, be, it, be it vegetarian, be it vegan, or be it around the environment, people are more um, uh, aware and, more, and are, are happy to, to look for more dishes produced this way. But we can't re for just park livestock here in Ireland and go, we've got to stop doing this. I say some livestock farmers in Ireland do produce livestock very, very well um, and others don't. So it's for me, it, it really is about showcasing sustainability. You know what I mean? Rather than showcasing a particular diet. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and, and putting that to the forefront for our consumers to see that by eating our food in this way, we have reduced our carbon footprint. It is more sustainable for the environment. And depending on the proteins and nutrients within the dishes can be better for the end eater as well. Yeah. So that's the view that we take from it. Um, yeah. You know, as I said, it, it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag. It depends on very much the seasons, depends very much on what's being farmed, when, how it's being farmed. And um, we do use meat on our menu, but we would look into the entire animal welfare of that. We would look at how it's farmed. We would look at during the winter when a lot of livestock and all is housed, what are they fed then in terms of is it grains imported from Europe or is it grains that's grown here in Ireland? So we're more about our carbon footprint and looking at a holistic point of view of an entire diet rather than just, you know, making a stand and saying, you know, meat protein shouldn't be used or anything. Like that. So it's more of a mixed uh, yeah. approach. And Connor, just just uh, the amount of meals you did last year in your food business. Well, be, before COVID, so last year we would produce over two million meals yeah. here in Ireland. Thank you. And um, you know we'd have over twenty cafes um, yeah. spaced around the West Coast, East Coast, Midlands. So we yeah. were doing it on a high a high number. 
Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of work, but it's it, it, it's worth doing that work yeah. to, to fix a broken food system. No, absolutely. Jumping across to you, Chef Selassie, um, how do you cook and experiment with different proteins in your kitchens and restaurants? And how do you use flavor to make them taste good? Um, I sort of, uh, I call my food uh, sort of a blend of um, culture, community and cuisine and intersecting that with environment, sustainability and economy. So as I'm putting together dishes, I'm thinking about the carbon footprint. I'm thinking about what's local and seasonal so that I can actually buy into the local economy. Um, in Ghana, we have a, a large amount of imported food. And so for me, um, a big part about it is using local, but also understanding that a lot of my diners are, are sub-Saharan Africans, which means that they are lactose intolerant. So I, I play around with um, not like non-dairy. So I use a lot of coconut milk. I use a lot of um, cashew um, to create my dishes. I've found treating um, vegetables with the same respect um, as you would with meat. So in many ways, it takes longer to develop the flavors, but as you're creating dishes, for example, there's one I use, um, igusi, which is a wild melon seed, um, adding some egg to that and actually preparing it in a, uh, a way that the end product looks nothing like the beginning, but developing flavors um, and spending time with different cooking techniques. Um, so that's kind of how I, I, I work with it. I Again, a lot of our... Uh, food culture has pres preservation. So yep. elements that are fry, um, dried, smoked, and bringing some of those um, preserved items into the dishes to create flavor is what I, I work towards. Um, it's just been interesting playing around with nuts and seeds, legumes, um, as well as just sort of the, um, you know, um, finding different ways of cooking goat. It's a, it's a very sort of tough meat. And uh, if you spend time with it, you can find ways to make it amazing and delicious. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, um, Chef. Um, we, we, we're coming to uh, answer a few questions from the, the community. But before we go there, I, I just want to talk about some of the driving, driving some of the action. And so in light of some of the step backs this past year, um, but also the crucial nature of 2021 for with the upcoming Food Systems Summit, I want to ask Dr. Uh, Namkolo, uh, what, in your view, needs to be done to drive progress and action in the area of protein livestock, uh, especially in view of the UN Food Systems Summit and Action Track 2 of shifting consumption patterns? Okay, so um, my internet has been a bit unstable, so hopefully you can hear me. We can. Um, the, the, the first thing is, in terms of Action 2, Action 2 looks at shift to sustainable consumption patterns. Yeah. So the first thing to say there is uh, the fact that our consumption patterns are already shifting. So we're not, we're not starting from scratch. They're already shifting. The problem is they're not going in the right direction where we would like to go. We would want to see sustenance of some of the good habits that we have. Um, as Salase, Chef Salase has referred to some of them, some of the animal source proteins that we have had that are not mainstream. Um, but then for, 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 for livestock production in terms of uh, where we are at on the, on the continent, it is extremely important to think in terms of the choices of production. Uh, what livestock is produced where and why. And also looking at the role that the livestock actually plays in, in people's lives. First, the, the Eat Lancet uh, uh, report actually made it very clear that we need to increase protein consumption on the African continent, both plant and animal uh, based protein. Uh, but if we are to increase animal-based protein, like I said earlier, our productivity levels are very low. Um, and, and also these are happening in areas that are semi-arid where nothing else will actually grow. So addressing issues there will be extremely important. And then the other thing that we need to look at is what is it that we actually need to sustain? So having more legumes and pulses we can sustain as a source of protein. However, we also have to pay attention to the amount of energy required to cook such, uh, such dishes. And so the research that needs to be done that was referred to earlier 
to produce uh, pulses and that are actually and legumes that are faster cooking is very useful. If we dig, for example, into Ethiopia, it was interesting that Dr. Kanayo talked about Ethiopia having the largest population of livestock. They have the largest population of livestock on the continent, but they also are consuming the least amount of <laughs> animal source protein because the cultural and religious settings are such that that is not what is supposed to happen. So as part of track two, using that as an example, we must make sure that whatever we consider as game changing is framed within the cultural context of a particular country to find solutions that are actually practical within that context. So that is extremely important. And then the other thing is to uh, remember in terms of food safety concerns that while we see a shift towards more nutrient dense foods, including animal protein, these are also the ones that give uh, significant food safety concerns. But it is happening at a time when our food safety systems are not in place uh, and are not, are not functioning properly. So some of the efforts that, for example, the African Union is making towards establishing a food safety index that has been well received by countries. Some of these efforts are important to incorporate into the game changing actions that we take forward. And as we move now, we've already now come this January, they have launched the African Continental Trade Agreement. That comes with issues around food safety that need to be harmonized across the continent mm. to facilitate a movement of, of food. And, and those elements must also be included within the game-changing actions that we then put forward. Otherwise, we're thinking game-changing, but we are not working within the context of the continent and where the continent seems to be going. So we lose that synergy that we could possibly build. And mm. what I would say is whatever we do, it must be framed within the context of the countries and what is happening at the regional level so that we can build momentum and synergy. Thank you. Thank you, um, Namkolo. Um, this, this is really um, helpful and, and I think uh, really gives a, a frame here. Um, I, I want to encourage people, it's good to see the conversation continuing online on socials using Protein Debate, One CGIR, um, Good Food for All. Um, I see that lots of people are sharing information, articles. This is really good, asking questions. And there's been a lot of that also coming through about alternate proteins, about the role of livelihoods, a lot of different things there. We're going to jump into a few of the questions and I'm going to ask our panel to be brief in their answers to the questions so we can move through as many as possible. The first one uh, is from uh, Daniel Kaplan, who is a chef from Colombia. He said, I'm curious, apart from policy, what does Dr. Nwanzwe feel is the biggest challenge to achieving equitable supply chains? So maybe a short uh, response, uh, Dr. Kanaya. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, well, the, the challenges uh, certainly can be um, as extensive as, as you want, you know. I, I do believe that currently, what we have, what what we see, that is, as I said, you know, agricultural research is actually central to transforming seeds, uh, food, food systems. In which case, agricultural research needs to be financed, to be supported and funded adequately. You know, not just not just enough, but adequately. And this will allow the CGR as as it as it as it rolls out its new innovation and financial. Uh, a strategy uh, to, to, to 20, 2030. So actually, in a strategy, as as you well, if you if you if you have the time to go into the site and see the strategy, it will actually address the issues that we're talking about here and put more resources into livestock. Uh, again, as was mentioned by I think Namakulo or someone else, that we need. Well, it's not just it's not just cattle and fish, or livestock and fish. You know, I mean, there's much. There's much broader than this. You have the, you have ruminants. You have the small ruminants. You have uh, the snails, for example, as was mentioned, and many other, you know, animal-based uh, foods or protein sources, which are not just what we see as cattle and fish or, or and chicken. It's much more, and we need to 
It is where the CGRS partnership with national systems who are engaged in those particular areas, or, or for example, the our, our forgotten crops or minor crops. Yeah. Where yeah. we need to support them through partnership and financing that is channeled to them. So the issues here are much broader, but it, it calls for a more holistic approach, strong partnerships, both you know, of our funders of the international community, but also national governments and institutions like the CTIR. Thank you, um, Dr. Um, another question from uh, Giovanni Amelio, a uh, student in food law. According to the panelists, what role can livestock farmers play and what expectations can they possibly have for the future? Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Namkolo, do you want to have a response to that one? Um, what role can livestock farmers play? L livestock farmers, we, we tend to think of them as um, individuals that don't know what they want to do. Um, they are really small scale entrepreneurs and looking for livelihoods to make money from what they are doing. So what role can livestock farmers play? Um, they can actually adopt better production practices, but for those to come forth, it requires for other systems in the public sector to work to avail those types of opportunities to them. So the, the, the role that they can play is actually improve their production efficiency, whatever they are producing. Um, they can play that role. The one area that we don't seem to give much uh, attention to is, and, and, and this is now I'm diverting from livestock. I find that there's a lot more research going on with insects production and what have you in Europe. Um, and yet on the African continent, I grew up eating termites and I don't see anybody trying to produce termites on the African <laughs> continent. The taste is already there. You don't have to encourage people to eat the stuff. They're already accustomed to do it, but our focus is elsewhere. So our livestock farmers could also become insect farmers, yeah. could also become farmers of snails and all these other animal source produce that people already have a taste for. Uh, and, and, and then what we, our responsibility in terms of researchers and policy officers is trying to figure out how we can create an enabling environment for them to be able to succeed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple more questions I want to try and get in. So there's one from Gordon Bacon, the CEO of Pulse Canada. And he said, the measure of protein production for human nutrition ought to be and needs to be ecosystem specific. For some ecosystems, grazing animals will be best to use uh, use of natural grassland. In other areas, use of scarce groundwater to grow plants may not be the best use of limited resource. What must be done to develop an ecosystem specific land use metrics to ensure that guidelines for land use for food production address the issues of defined and specific e ecological and environmental impacts? Um, this is a big question. Um, let's, uh, let's ask Dr. Kanayo to uh, share a couple of reflections. Well, you know, I think I think uh, from from right from the the uh, introductory remarks by from from Lawrence, you know, not one size fits all, and this is also in this paper as it applies to uh, meat-based diets or otherwise. The same thing applies to what the, what this question is. It has to be uh, specific, country specific, as well as ecolo I mean, the ecology we're dealing with. So it may work in one, in one particular context, and in the other context, it may not work. Depends on whether you have enough lands, uh, or whether you have enough water, or whether you have enough grasslands. So it has to be context specific. I don't think there will ever be one global recommendation to address your question. Yeah. And this is what yeah. I was trying to drive at. You see, when you look at the way the CGR operates and its partnership structure, and it works with a range of partners, both in the research and research for development spectrum and the policy and governments, it addresses its solutions, it, it works and develops solutions that are context specific. So it would be, it would be, it would be foolhardy for me to tell you that this is what should be done. It has to be seen in the context of the ecology of the social context of the people and so on and so, so, and so forth. So there's not just one answer to your question. Yeah. 
So, just, so building building on that question, I'm going to go to um, one of either Chef Connor or Chef Celestia, or both of you might want to comment. There's a question here from Alison uh, Greenhall. What's the role of regulate regulation here, both as an incentive? Um, and also to help incite change? Should this be locally tailored or do we see the need for this global coordination? Uh, do you wanna either of you jump in on that or both of you? I mean, if I can start, um, it definitely has to be global. Um, I'll just use a small example from Ghana. Um, a lot of our poultry farmers um, have lost their livelihoods due to importation of, of poultry into Ghana. Um, we can talk about the inferior poultry that's coming in from Europe, meaning the one that's kept too long and cannot be sell sold in the European market gets sent to Africa. We can talk about the stuff that is coming in from cold chains that are, you know, question mark about how they're being produced. So I think it has to be a global conversation. There are people that are producing too much and are flooding markets where people are lo losing livelihoods. Um, so I think that's that's very important. And again, the rural urban, you know, what are we eating in Accra versus what's being eaten in Tamale? So again, it, it, it need, it's, it's again, it's a global system, unfortunately, um, which makes it complex. But I think if we don't attack it as a global system, we're gonna lose out on some of the, the really important nuances that are um, challenging a lot of different livelihoods. Yeah, Connor. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I totally agree. And I think that um, we have to, stop working in our silos and look at the planet as a whole because it is a global food system and what one shoe doesn't fit all so what might suit one country may never suit another because of you know because of different reasons because of different soils different biodiversity the climate and so on um, and and i think a lot of people are stuck to working in their own silo and looking at what's on their doorstep and trying to come up with a solution to that but the impact of one solution on a small country or a large country will not help or will not um, work on a planetary basis. And I think, you know, from a chef's point of view, and I've always said this to chefs as well, is that, you know, think outside the kitchen. It's not just about what we're doing here. We've got to look at a global food system and we've got to look, food has to travel. We know that, you know, um, to feed 10 billion people, food is going to have to travel more. So how do we make it better globally and, and, you know, and, and share that approach and share the research that helps us as a planet to, to, to be better and feed more people? Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, well, thank you. We're coming, we're coming towards the end of the session. Um, thank you for the great questions coming in through the audience. We have captured um, all the questions and, and please take them over to social media. I know um, our panelists, um, the organizations involved are all on social media and there are people trying to answer and respond. There's lots of good information being shared. Um, I'm going to, uh, in a second, uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Canayo to give some closing remarks on the discussion. But um, first, I wanted to just have a one sentence uh, reflection from um, uh, Chef Connor, Chef Selassie, and Dr. Namkolo on just your reflections um, and takeaway from this um, session. So one, maybe two sentences, um, please. Who, anyone want to go first? Yeah, sorry, I, I, I'm probably being repetitive, but um, let's just remember it like it's, it's one planet, it's one food system. And I think um, listening today to the speakers as well um, shows that more so than ever that, you know, we got to think globally and not so much just locally. Thanks, Connor. I, I want to make my last comment uh, borrowing from what uh, Chef Selassie said about the loss of livelihoods in the Ghanaian poultry uh, uh, pr production uh, sector. Um, that's when our farmers are not able to compete. Uh, we're coming running behind and people have already changed three buttons in a relay. And so putting in place policy uh, instruments that can actually protect and give us a chance to move forward would actually be very useful. Um, and, 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 and it's not just in Ghana, other countries are facing the same thing. It's not that they're not able to produce the poultry, it's, it's that the efficiencies are not there. And this is where our researchers can actually help us to actually give us that equitable chance to move forward. 
but we also need to be careful what those policy instruments look like because you can also become so protective that it works against you. Yeah. So it, this balance is required and it's important to really uh, think some of these carefully, but we do need to get a fair chance at uh, that development to actually take place. And research is our best place uh, to, to actually help us supported by the right policy instruments. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Chef Selassie. I think um, my last word would really just say that I look forward to more collaborations across the various stakeholders in the food system. Um, and definitely there needs to be a lot more money and resources put into both the documentation and understanding of a lot of the traditional food ways, um, what was working uh, and how we can actually scale those into the modern population. Um, so looking at behavior change and supporting research. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chef. Um, so I, 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 we're gonna, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Kanayo to uh, give some closing uh, remarks and maybe also to mention just, we're obviously in the impact of this pandemic as, at the moment as well. Maybe you can make a couple of uh, reflections on the, the pandemic um, and the, the potential impacts that will have. Um, I, I, I will just say, I, I see in the chat, lots of conversations about the Food Systems Summit there is ways to feed in information. So if you don't feel these perspectives are being heard um, around the role of livestock, please feed them in. There is some um, uh, game-changing solution opportunities. There's food system dialogues. There's lots of opportunities for uh, input at the moment. And, and, and many of those that are involved, I know Dr. Kanayo, you're very involved. Others are very happy to hear these perspectives and to try and feed them in. So I just wanna make that that clear. So we're, um, thank you to uh, our fellow panelists. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Dr. Kanayo for uh, some brief remarks. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul. And thanks, thanks again to our panelists. Um, this has been quite a very, um, well, intense, intense one and a half hours with a lot of great ideas. Um, well, actually to kind of wrap up I think our key our key key um, our, our keynote speakers or um, our speakers that gave the opening remarks uh, Lawrence I think Lawrence put it very 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 succinctly succinctly and he summed up by his last statement uh, called for a nuanced perspective you know, a nuance is our friend and ideology is our enemy and that is as we will say that is very pregnant with meaning and you can actually expand it, can actually summarize a lot. Um, I think uh, Gunhild did say something about, you know, meat is not, is not the problem. There's overproduction and overconsumption in some, in some geographies and underproduction and underconsumption in others. And she described three pathways in her, in her statement. But I think that is very clearly uh, what comes out of our conversation is that it's, it's, it's quite, we have to have a holistic, a holistic view. We'll have to look at health, nutrition, livelihoods, environmental outcomes as well in, our, in, this, in, the, in, this, in this debate well, going forward. Geography and income matter very much. Now we, we spoke about you know, advanced countries, we also spoke about low income and low, middle, low and middle income countries. Um, but these are basically geographies, if you want to look at it that way. And of course, these matter how we address the issue of, of protein or basically of um, uh, 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 food consumption. High, um, as I said, high, medium and low income countries need to take different actions. So actually, I think as uh, Chef um, uh, mentioned that, you know, <clears throat> well, Yes, we, we, we need to look at climate is one climate. We need to look at food systems as a whole. We need to think globally, but also we need to act locally. So why we think globally? So it's not, it's not just basically thinking globally and acting globally, but we also have to, 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 to act globally. That is basically, again, think, our actions have to be context specific. Um, <clears throat> there needs to be a radical alignment of food systems around the world, and this is needed. And also, as I, as I, as I, did, as I did say, uh, research and innovation drive transformation. 
Uh, this is this is this is basic. I mean, no matter how you argue it, in all in actually in all fields of human life, research. I mean, you just talked. You asked me to talk about COVID. Look, look at where we are. A year ago, who would have thought that we'll have vaccines? Up to almost six vaccines now in different parts of the world that have been used to 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 fight this this pandemic. So research is fundamental. It is needed for us to solve the problems of the world. And research in all fields, particularly in agricultural research, needs more funding. We need more investment in agri-research to generate scientific innovation. No question about it. But livestock research is underfunded. And the CGIL has done its fantastic uh, analysis on, on research to various, uh, uh, to, to various aspects of its work. And livestock research is underfunded. And as I mentioned again, we'll talk about livestock. It's not just cattle and chicken alone, um, but a whole range of animal source proteins. And some of them are actually neglected. And when you go to rural communities, it, any part of the world, you'll be amazed to what extent that they have their own specific animal, animal uh, based foods. Um, <clears throat> The one CGIR, which, which again, I think Lawrence has drawn attention uh, to, to, to basically see, um, again, what, uh, I think I drew attention, please we'll see exactly what the, the, the new CGIR strategy, innovation uh, strategy is aiming at, is to basically address in a more holistic approach, this problem, this situation of food security, and environmental, basically food security, climate change, addressing this as, as holistic. And just interestingly that we have five, uh, five, uh, five, five, I mean, five, five tracks that we're looking at for the, the United Nations Food System Summit. We also have five areas within the CGR, CGR strategy that are going to be very pivotal in achieving the new, the new strategy. Um, <clears throat> I think also I must add that we, we have, we've had some very interesting contribution from our, our chefs. Uh, people want delicious food, not, not labels. As, and the same we need to address food systems holistic, holistically to parts of it. Same thing applies to, you know, to the foods that people eat. Ashif Connor has actually shared, 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 uh, <clears throat> said that, to, to, uh, spoke from there about research. One solution from one country, as I said, won't work for, for planetary solutions. We need to work together. And both our chefs call for collaboration and, 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 and research. And to basically to, 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 to answer to, I think I will conclude that because otherwise I'll keep repeating what has been said. It's so, it's so rich and there's no way I can summarize the, the, the knowledge and the experiences that have been shared by our panelists. But on, this, on, on, the, on the COVID, but the CGR also has a COVID hub which again is looking at the impact of COVID on research and research for development. And I think one thing we should take away, uh, you know, COVID is not just a pandemic, a disease. It's a great destabilizer, a great disruptor. It's disrupted lives, disrupted the financial systems, the economies, uh, social, social segment. Basically it has disrupted our way of life. I think, I think for me, rather than the common cry and, and hope, so frantic hope of things returning to, to normal, it is impossible to return to the normal of yesterday. We're having a total shift in the global arena. And we have to see how we will adapt to this new, to this new, new normal, if you call it a new normal. But there's no way the world is going to return to the normal of yesterday. And we have to adjust ourselves to what is in front of us. And I think that the pandemic is only a precursor of more things to happen. As long as we do not put our resources, our energies to tackling this problem of climate change, we're gonna have more problems facing humanity. I think COVID-19 is only a precursor and it's a warning to humanity to focus its efforts, whether it's through agricultural research and development or other, other activities that we do to basically focus and finance activities and research and work that is going into combating the impact of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanayo. I'd like to thank all of our speakers and panelists.
um, for your inspirational and engaging inputs and discussions. I'd like to thank you as our audience uh, for making the time to join us for the uh, great questions, the inputs. There's lots in the that was coming through the chat. I saw lots of people appreciating some of the the contrib contributions going there with statistics. Um, I, I want to give a big shout out to our, our partner for this event, CGIR, for their work and support. If you're not aware of it, I know we've talked uh, uh, about their work um, in this conversation and we, we, we will continue through the year um, in different ways because I think it's really critical and um, it's really critical for us to transform the food system, to invest in, in the research, the science, around how we do that. And so um, please, please check that out. Uh, please get involved in the upcoming UN Food Systems Summit. The action tracks, including one and two, which we heard from today, but there's also three, four and five, are really looking for game-changing solutions. They have opportunities uh, for you to share that. Um, we also will encourage you to continue the conversation online um, with hashtag protein debate. Um, to keep looking for nuance and to focus on exactly what we need to do to drive change. Um, the, the webinar has been live streamed on the SDG2 Advocacy Hub Facebook channel. We'll also share it if you want to rewatch or share it on our YouTube channel um, in the coming days. And I think just, you know, a couple of quick snapshots before we close. Let's remember that we're just, we are talking about food here. We're, we're not just about nutrients, commodities or products. We're actually talking about food and people engage in food and people bring their culture, their backgrounds, all kinds of their location, um, all, all to that food. And so um, proteins are in different foods and they can have different roles in cultural celebration, history, recipes, and we must acknowledge that. Um, it's also eaten for many reasons, to nourish, to celebrate, to taste good, to sustain us, um, you know, in a combination, it's not just, you know, by itself. And there is also still a lot we can do to reduce the impact on the planet. Um, there's lots of things that research and science can guide us on, and we need to continue to do that. And I think I really want to um, leave us with this um, idea that, you know, a lot of our pragmatic solutions ultimately need to, to coexist. You know, it's not a one size fits all. I think sometimes our debates are about going from this to this, and it's not about all this space in the middle where there's so many things we can do to improve effectiveness, to reduce impact um, around people and planet. And um, I, I, I love you know, the statement that Lawrence launched us with um, at, at the end is that nuance is our friend and ideology is our enemy. So let's keep a, a healthy dialogue going. Um, let's share ideas. I know there was lots of people asking for contact details for chefs and, and research and other things. Get online, check these guys out, follow them on Instagram, on, on Twitter, see what they're doing. They're sharing their stories, sharing ideas. Let's collaborate and work together. So thank you um, all for joining. Um, we're looking forward uh, to uh, 2021 and really driving change um, on many, many levels. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank all. you. Thank you.